Death that Bishops Keep, Chapter 6 It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice Charles climbed into the barouche and placed his camera on the seat, his bag of exposed plates, tripod and other gear on the floor. The man in the opposite seat lowers his, lowered his newspaper. I must say, Sheridan, he said lazily, I'm not altogether sure what fascinates you about these old Roman ruins. Not much value being dug up these days, I wager. Charles sat down with a slight laugh. Perhaps not, but the remains that were dug up this morning were rather of interest. As it happens, there was a bit of foul play. You don't say. Bradford Marston folded the newspaper and raised his voice slightly. Drive on, Foster. The coachman lifted the reins and the carriage lurched into its place in the stream of traffic on the cobble street behind a brewer's dilapidated dray and a farm wagon filled with baskets of fresh lettuces and cornflowers. A foreign gentleman was unceremoniously dispatched and shoved into an excavation, Charles said. The local constabulary were unseen going about a semblance of investigation. He leaned back in the seat and pulled down his hat brim and began to reflect on the morning's events. To be truthful, they had stimulated him in a way that he rarely felt stimulated, except perhaps with the discovery of new species of flora or the sight of an unnamed fossil. One of the hazards of having sufficient money to be at one's leisure was the hazard of continually finding oneself bored by the banality of one's existence and hence forced to seek new forms of intellectual stimulation. Murder was most stimulating. To engage his mind, Charles had throughout most of his 33 years employed himself with various scientific studies. At nine, he accomplished his paleontologist grandfather in the pursuit of fossil shells and corals at walton on the Nays. At twelve, he produced a field guide to local species of edible fungi, hand-illustrated and annotated. At fifteen, he devised a detective camera small enough to be concealed beneath the waistcoat, with the intent to take pictures on the sly. At Eton and Oxford, Charles did not exercise the discipline of narrow specialization in any science, but rather indulged himself in a broad study of all. His natural powers of observation were remarkably keen, exceeded only by his insatiable curiosity. As his fatigable memory and his unflagging powers of inquiry, but he did require something of interest to excite those powers. Murder, eh? Bradford folded the newspaper and tossed it aside. That's what it is. No doubt the papers will trumpet it. They're a wash in blood. That extraordinary murder discovered in Great Melbourne Street, for instance, the woman who carried off the body of a murdered man in a trunk. One read of nothing else for weeks, I say, Sheridan. He added casually. I've been meaning to ask your advice about an investment. Charles glanced at him. I'm hardly up on commerce. Too busy with other matters, I'm afraid. Uh, but inventions are rather in your line, Bradford replied as the carriage passed a green park where white-aproned nannies pushed back wickerwork perambulators in the afternoon. He took a cigarette out of the monogrammed gold case. What do you think about these new motor cars? Charles raised his eyebrows. Motor cars? The mechanical problems are really quite intriguing, particularly those having to do with the power transmission and steering. For instance, the rims on the inside and outside wheels do not travel the same distance in a turn, but outside actually travels farther than the inside. What I mean to say, Bradford interrupted, is what do you think about motor cars as an investment? He lighted his cigarette. Charles was thoughtful. The mechanical problems are not insurmountable. In my view, the primary impediments are social and economic. For example, when cars can travel faster than 12 miles an hour. They can now, Bradford said crossly, but the law won't allow it. Uh, the laws will be changed to meet the times, Charles replied, settling into his explanation. But faster speeds require superior roads, which will mean an increase in taxes. Building an adequate fuel distribution system will take time, and eventually there will have to be an entirely new maintenance industry. All this could require 20 or 30 years. If the investors are looking for a quick return on their money, they will be disappointed. Bradford sighed heavily, consulted an engraved gold pocket watch. 
We're just in time to meet Elna and Aunt Penelope at the railway station. I hope you don't object. Charles put his hat brim down further. Object? Why should I object? Your sister is a delightful young woman. If constant chatter about weddings is not great on your ears, Bradford replied, pocketing his watch. He was a handsome man with a certain negligent rackishness, but there were lines of worry about his eyes and he wore an uncharacteristically serious look. Charles wondered if perhaps he had lost more at the steeplechase than he had admitted to doing, or whether his worry was connected with motor cars. But Charles would no more inquire about his friend's investments than ask after his mistresses. Chatter about wetting annoys you, does it? Charles replied in a tone of friendly banter. Just wait, Marston. When your mother has finished arranging your sister's wedding, she will turn her attention to yours. It must be high time to assure the continuation of the Marston baronetcy. Bradford Marston shuddered and closed his eyes briefly. Then, recollecting himself, he turned to Charles. You needn't be so smug, my dear chap. It has not escaped my attention that my mother would like to make a certain arrangement where you were concerned. The corners of his mouth quirked as he glanced at Charles' dusty head. Despite that ridiculous hat of yours. Charles sobered. He had accepted Bradford Marston's invitation to spend a month at Marston Manor for the purpose of documenting the Colchester dig, as well as pursuing various interests, among them a few rare local flora and some fascinating Cenozoic coleanthrates. He had no intention of being ambushed by a maternal attempt at matrimonial arranging. I presume, Charles said somberly, that you are referring to Patsy. If Charles was rarely frustrated in his determined search for knowledge, he was frequently frustrated when it came to the fairer sex. This had certainly been the case since his arrival the previous week at Marston Manor. He had sensed from the outset that Lady Henrietta Marston had her own aims for his visit, and that those aims involved her, young, her younger daughter. To make things worse, the daughter's intentions in the matter were clearly those of the mother. The two were in cahoots. Bradford raised his eyebrows. Would that be such a disaster, old man? Charles' response was carefully diplomatic. Your sister is liberally endowed with Marston beauty and grace, as well as Marston wit, but she is, after all, barely eighteen, and not yet out. I am deeply honoured and complimented by Lady Henrietta's consideration, but I think she would do well to look someone nearer Patsy's age. I am too old for her. He did not add, although he might have, that Patsy Marston was a flippity gibbet whose conversation flittered like a butterfly between balls and bonnets. She was the last woman in the world that he would have considered. Damn it, old man, Marston grumbled. Don't talk as if you were poised on the verge of the grave. You're only thirty-three, even if you are a musty old scientist. And you come from excellent family. The Marston would be honoured. I would be honoured to entrust Patsy's future to you. Charles smiled. You forget, happily falling back in his, upon his strongest argument, that I am a younger son. Younger sons, as Bradford Marston very well knew, were generally left without inheritance, while the family jewels, family estate, and the family title, if there was one, were bestowed in their entirety upon the elder son. In Charles' situation, the fact that his brother Robert had inherited the bulk of their father's money was fortuitously offset by a sizable legacy from his maternal grandmother. In other words, he was possessed of a substantial fortune. But Charles had several times successfully deployed his status as a younger son as a shield against the menace of matrimony. He expected it to work in this instance as well. But Bradford only laughed. Come now, Sheridan, you can't hide behind that ruse with me. We've been friends for too long. I know, as does his mother, that you have enough to support Patsy quite comfortably. Bradford did not add that the Marstons, whose fortune had slipped into a lengthy decline, precipitated by Grandfather Marston's regrettable losses at the gaming table, exacerbated by Bradford's father equally regrettable love of expensive but ill-fated horseflesh, would be greatly relieved if their younger daughter were to marry into Charles Sheridan's respectable family and quite ample fortune. His pale blue eyes twinkled. And who knows, perhaps a few months spent traipsing in the out-of-the-way corners of the world carrying those cameras of yours might sober her sufficiently to allow her to think beyond the next gown and slippers. 
In the distance, the train whistle could be heard and the chugging of the engine, and Bradford leaned towards the tap of the coachman's shoulder. The whip, Foster. Patsy is quite delicious, just as she is, Charles lied, as the carriage moved forward smartly. I would not change her for the world. No, Master, you and your mother will have to indulge me. Patsy will make some fortunate man a loving, if not dutiful, wife. But I have not yet found the right woman. Perhaps, he paused, on the gravelled footpath beside the street, two rosy-cheeked young women with elaborately piled hair and ruffled silk parasols smiled flirtatiously at the occupants of the carriage. For Bradford benefit, he spoke heavily, a man weighted by disappointed hopes. Perhaps I never shall. Nonsense, Marston said, tipping his bowler at the two young women. And don't you be so quick to reject Patsy. She is young yet, with the husband's firm hand guiding her development, she could become a charming wife. Charles pursed his lips. A wife, charming or otherwise, was not in his scheme of things.